many of you know me, most of you don't. I'm Mike Littleton, I'm the Deputy Chancellor, and uh, the Chancellor's diversity in the North is either on the uh, reports to me. Uh, I wanted to take this opportunity to welcome you all to this first in our uh, Leadership and Diversity series. Uh, several months ago, Dean Churchill and I were having lunch over at the Youth Lab talking about issues of diversity on campus. And it came to us that it would probably be beneficial if we had some of the leadership on campus. Instead of having the Chancellor's Diversity Initiative or myself all of talking about diversity on this campus, to recognize that, that diversity is really a responsibility of everybody in our community. Uh, I'm a, I'm a civil rights lawyer from way back. I've been doing civil rights law for 40 years. And one thing I've learned over that period is that legal mandates in this area uh, are not always the best way to go. Uh, you can tell people what to do, and you can drag people into court and convince a judge that they're not uh, doing the right thing or, in fact, doing the wrong thing. But the way to get people to really embrace diversity, especially in a higher education institution, as an educational value, uh, to embrace the concept of improving the quality of what we do by recognizing many, many different perspectives, backgrounds, cultures uh, with which we engage, is to get people to understand those fundamental concepts. Uh, believe in them, and then work on them. And that's what we try to do here at, at MU. Uh, some universities have huge organizations with vice presidents for diversity, with, with staffs of 100 people running around uh, promoting diversity and, and demanding diversity. Uh, we have a very small staff, Noor, Rebecca, Nikki, uh, Noel English, and a few graduate students. Uh, and their function is to work with people like uh, Dean Churchill, Dean Desson, uh, others on this campus, and their staffs that are engaged in this very important work of trying to diversify our campus, uh, utilize the diversity that we have, and appreciate the diversity that we have in improving the education that we give and improving the climate and culture on this campus. So we thought it would be a good idea to have some of those leaders on this campus come and talk about what they're doing. Uh, come and talk about what they've tried, and what's failed, and what's worked. And hopefully uh, through this mechanism of sparks and conversation, uh, we invite input from other leaders on campus, student leaders, and our general population. Uh, we need to have a very serious discussion about what we're doing on this campus in the way of diversifying the campus and appreciating the diversity that we have. So this is the kickoff in a series of, of uh, presentations from folks on campus who have been committed to and working in this area for a very, very long time. So I just wanted to stand up here and uh, tell you how much I appreciate your all coming. Uh, I haven't seen this many people in, in Jesse Ranch Auditorium. Uh, in a while, so that means that there are folks who are interested in the subject. So I hope you sit back and enjoy the presentation and feel free to ask any questions or make any comments uh, that you have. To introduce our speaker, I'd like to introduce Nora Cezanne Gardner, who is our Chief Diversity Officer on this campus, you probably all know for it better than I do, or at least as well. So, Nora. Of you to our first leadership in diversity series and I cannot thank Dean Churchill enough to be the inaugural speaker for today. Um, at this time I'm going to read um, this incredible bio, uh, illustrious bio of our, our Dean at the School of Medicine, um, Robert Churchill MD is the Hugh E. and Sarah D. Stevenson Dean and Gwilyn Ludwig and Maria Antonia Ludwig Distinguished Professor in Radiology at the University of Missouri School of Medicine. Um, he became Dean in 2009 and Dr. Churchill launched since then a comprehensive quality improvement effort 
transform graduate medical education, advance biomedical and translational research, and focus on improving diversity and cultural competency at, ME, at the School of Medicine. Dr. Churchill previously led the Department of Radiology, the Medical School, and Health Sciences Center during his more than 20 years with MU. He arrived at MU in 1987 as Chair and Professor of Radiology. After three years as the Medical School's Vice Dean, Dr. Churchill became Interim Dean in 1998. He has also served as Interim Vice Chancellor and Chief Executive Officer for MU's Health Sciences Center until 2000 when he returned to the Department of Radiology. Um, before joining MU, Dr. Churchill served as Vice Chair of Radiology at Loyola University in Maywood, Illinois, where he completed medical school, residency, and fellowship training. He has also completed a fellowship at General Electric and served the company as an advisor. As Dean, this is quite impressive, Dr. Churchill oversees the medical school's more than 675 faculty, 1,500 staff, and a thousand medical students, residents, fellows, and other students completing advanced degrees. He is also responsible for university physicians, the practice plan for the medical school's faculty physicians, and works closely with the medical school's more than 7,700 physician alumni. The MU Medical Alumni Organization presented him with an honorary medical alumni award in 2004. Dr. Churchill also directs the school's strategic planning process, which follows the Baldrige Performance Excellence Program, a framework for quality improvement and innovation. Um, the medical school has adopted the Baldrige criteria as its management model in 2009 under his leadership. And without much ado, I would like to um, pass this mic over to Dean Churchill. And at the same time, also welcome um, Provost Foster to the um, auditorium and also Deputy Provost Ken Dean as well, who are the other deans that um, we uh, mentioned earlier by um, Deputy Chancellor Middleton. Dean Churchill, all yours. Uh, thanks, Nora. Um, first of all, uh, I'm not going to uh, give a lecture on diversity. I don't have a PowerPoint presentation. I'm not going to present a bunch of statistics. I don't consider myself necessarily an expert on diversity. Uh, it's something that I have been uh, interested in for a long time. I uh, won't get into all of the gory details of when I was a kid and growing up, but I grew up in a very diverse uh, situation mostly in poverty and a very diverse uh, families within the uh, tenement buildings that I lived in. Um, cold water, four room apartment uh, with, uh, you know, uh, parents and sister. Uh, and so um, and when I was having this job uh, as an interim from 1998 to 2000, uh, I tried to uh, start some things uh, along the lines of increasing diversity because I didn't see that we really were very diverse and I didn't think that we were really paying a lot of attention to something that I thought was very important. What I didn't understand was that you can't just start some things and expect them to continue. It's a lot more complicated than that. Uh, you really have to uh, bring people along to understand why diversity and the changes are important to the entire organization and it will have a direct impact on them. And then it is much easier to start to make some changes that will uh, stay put uh, going forward. Just to start a few programs and then I go, I retired after I finished the, the stint as an interim. Uh, in 2000, uh, and nothing really uh, stayed. Um, so now I'm back in this job again, and uh, uh, this time not as an interim, and this time I decided to uh, really address uh, the issues of diversity in the School of Medicine uh, in a way we hadn't before. When I started uh, this time, we did not have uh, a dean for diversity. We had uh, Tracy Wilson-Kleekamp uh, as a .2 FTE 
uh, kind of uh, recruiter, um, and uh, not a lot else, actually. And so there were some changes that uh, you know we needed to make. Now, one of the things that I want to do uh, is to tell you why I feel diversity is important from my perspective as a dean of a medical school. It may not be the same perspective that other colleges on campus have, but let me tell you why it's important uh, from, um, uh, for, for the medical school. Now, Nora mentioned Baldrige and some other things, and so the thing that's important to understand that diversity is not just a carve-out that we're doing. Diversity is in the context of a whole program for uh, performance improvement and excellence. And there's no question in my mind that we are not going to achieve the goals that we need unless we have a more diverse staff, faculty, and student body. It's just not going to happen. So when I came on board uh, three years ago, I decided that the thing that I'd be most proud for us to stand for is quality. And first and foremost is quality in patient care. And you're not going to have quality in education and research unless you have quality in patient care. It became clear to me early on that we weren't going to be as good as we could be unless we had the right people. So we have been using structured interviews for the last couple of years to hire people. I decided, uh, and others uh, in the country have decided, that you can't be the best unless you have the best. And we have let go about I don't know, 16 to 18 faculty over the last uh, year and a half, uh, which just pointed out to me that we didn't do a very good job in hiring some of these people in the first place. And so we want to hire the best people from the get-go. And so we've been doing that. And then the Baldrige criteria is the uh, format that we have developed uh, because, uh, uh, to quote Aristotle, this was attributed to him, that excellence is not an act, it's a habit. And what the Baldrige criteria forces you to do is to become habitual with planning and changing processes to become better and better each year and to go through cycles of improvement. So it becomes a habit, not just a one-of-a-kind act. And diversity is, is, a, is a big piece of that. Uh, it, it's a very important part. So even if I mention it last, it doesn't mean that it's last. Um, so, um, and I view diversity as not, uh, as a very broad definition, not a narrow definition. So to me, uh, the first thing people think of are uh, race and ethnicity as uh, diversity. It is that, but it's a lot more than that. Uh, it's people with disabilities, it's people from lower socioeconomic uh, um, uh, uh, comings. Uh, it's the LGBT, uh, and if you look at what Edna's definition of diversity is, they throw in people coming back from Afghanistan and Iraq, uh, people who were the first uh, child in, in, in their uh, family to go to college, uh, people whose families uh, speak a different language than English at home. So it's a big, broad definition. And unless we're paying attention to all of that diversity, we are not going to become a, uh, a strong uh, medical school. Now, why is it important? For, for a medical school, to me, it's important because we are dealing with training and education issues and health care delivery. If you take a look at the population of the United States today, between the ages of one minute and 18 years of age, Caucasians are in a minority. By 2040 to 2050, that's the entire United States. If you look at right now, the combination today of Hispanics and African Americans, it's about 30% of the population. If you take a look at the combination of African American physicians and Hispanic physicians in the United States as a percentage of all the physicians in the United States, that's 6%, okay? Now, it's pretty clear that most people uh, like to go to uh, uh, physicians that uh, are more like them than less like them. And so I think we have an obligation uh, to pay attention to diversity, uh, to uh, start graduating physicians that uh, are more diverse than what we had in the past. 
Let me give you a story, uh, a couple of stories about, it's, it's about connection. So I try to have um, lunch with the chaplains at the VA and uh, the University Hospital. I try to do it once a quarter, sometimes we don't make it. But I was talking to Father Patrick, who is a Catholic priest at the VA, and uh, he related the story to me that he was making rounds in the intensive care unit one day, and there was a discussion going on between two doctors and a patient, all from different racial and ethnic backgrounds. Father Patrick sensed that, you know, there was something uh, funny about the conversation. It didn't appear that it was going well. So after the two physicians left, he goes over and talks to the patient. And here is what the patient told Dr. Patrick. I don't trust these physicians, and I don't believe anything they tell me. Now, what do you think about that person's future health care outcomes? When you've got a doctor who has not made a connection with the patient and they get discharged on some medication, what do you think the likelihood that they're going to take this medication if they don't trust the doctor or believe anything they say? They're going to come back in for a readmission probably within a month, and that gets very expensive because people aren't paid now for readmissions for the same illness that they were discharged for if they come back within 30 days. Here's another example of not being able to make a connection. We had a speaker, Dr. Green, from Harvard University sometime last year, I guess, or a little over a year ago. And he was talking about, you know, why it's very important to develop cultural competency uh, within the faculty and the staff and the students, even if you don't have a very diverse faculty uh, and student body. We still are obligated to address cultural competency uh, in, in our medical students and our education. So he told of an example of, uh, he was in New York City before he went to Harvard, so this was a patient in New York City. And he told a story that uh, there was a woman that uh, they were seeing who had high blood pressure and she was also a type 2 diabetic and was taking oral medication. And she was from Puerto Rico. And they were having a hard time controlling her high blood pressure and her blood glucose uh, because, you know, it wasn't clear if she was taking the medicine. She spoke Spanish, they had an interpreter there, but clearly they weren't making a connection. So somebody decided to make a house call from, I think it was New York University, uh, where she was a patient. And they went to her house. And they spent some time talking to her. And she was not taking her medication. Her mother uh, also had type 2 diabetes and had hypertension. And she lived in Puerto Rico. And she developed cancer of the pancreas. Somebody in Puerto Rico told the daughter, who is now in New York City, that all the pills her mother had taken for her diabetes and her high blood pressure accumulated in her stomach. And that's right next to the pancreas, and that's what caused the pancreatic cancer. Now you see, if you can't make that connection and, and get that piece of history, it, it doesn't make sense why she's not taking her medication unless she believes that her mother died of pancreatic cancer because of the medication she was taking for her high blood pressure <laughs> and her type 2 diabetes. So we have to be able to make those connections with, with our patients. So it's of uh, utmost importance. Now, you know, one of the things that um, we do on the first day of medical school and on the graduation day, you know, when I, I graduated from medical school in 72, we actually took the Hippocratic Oath, okay? Um, but there are other oaths that people take, and the one that we've taken here, our students have elected to take every year I've been here, and I've been here for 24 graduations, is the Declaration of Geneva. It is a uh, oath put together by the World Health Organization in 1948, and there's been about six revisions since then. So we make our first year medical students on the first day take the oath and then we give it to them at graduation. Now I want to read one of the things. 
uh, in the oath. I will not permit considerations of age, disease, or disability, creed, ethnic origin, gender, nationality, political affiliation, race, sexual orientation, social standing, or any other factor to intervene between my duty and my patient. This is our mission statement. This is the mission statement for being a physician. This is what we swear to, okay? And you see, all of the things that I read in, in that particular bullet of this oath is all about disability. So we expect people to obey this, but yet we're not really providing the education for diversity within the School of Medicine to the extent that it needs to be. And this is not just about skin color. This is about all the things that I talked about. You know, we had the uh, people from campus, what was it, two years ago, you guys came over and made a presentation to us about disability. Because I'd heard it at one of the Council of Deans meetings, and I thought, really, I want all of the, our department chairs to hear this. So it was something I hadn't thought about. You know, X percentage of the population is colorblind. And we've all always pretty... PowerPoint slides with probably all kinds of colors to make a point, you know, red, green, blue, you know, and somebody who's colorblind isn't seeing those colors, you know. But it's just, you know, we don't think of a lot of things. We need to start paying attention to a lot more things than we have in the past. And so we're trying to put more into uh, education. Um, in the first and second years, and in the third and fourth years, and also into uh, the residency programs. Um, the other thing that we are required to do, um, our accreditation organization for all the medical schools in, in the country uh, is the LCME, it's the Liaison Committee on Medical Education, and it is part AMA and part AAMC, which is the Association of American Medical Colleges. That's who comes around to accredit us every eight years. And I was on the self-study group uh, when they were here in 2007, 2008, and I actually wrote the uh, piece on governance um, of the medical school. And uh, in preparation for writing that piece, I went back and looked at the last four LCME site visits. So it's going back like 32 years. There were two things we got cited, cited for every single time they visited us. Level of state funding and lack of diversity. Okay, every single time. So this time we actually had to send them a plan that we had to show them what our plan was to increase diversity at our School of Medicine. So for us, it's an education issue, it's a health delivery issue, it's part of our mission statement, our oath as a physician, and it's also part of a mandate from our accrediting body. So, so I come on board and um, I thought, well, you know, we gotta get up to speed here. Um, and so we did not have a diversity team. So then, I appointed uh, Dr. Ellis Ingram, Senior Associate Dean for, Diverse, uh, for Diversity and Inclusion. We had uh, Tracy, who was .2 FTE recruiter. That was it. So I made her a one FTE uh, recruiter. All right. We've since hired a second recruiter. So we, we, we got that in place. So I figured, okay, what's our strategy? Now, Dr. Ingram, uh, and others have had pipeline connections with schools in Kansas City and St. Louis, mostly St. Louis. He has this Caleb program. He has really on his own without any support from the medical school basically or very little over the years. He has a program for grade school uh, students in town to come to the medical center to learn about science on Saturdays. He has a program with high school students that do a research, summer research project uh, in the School of Medicine. And this last year, we started a summer research program uh, for um, uh, college students. And it's all underrepresented minorities in medicine. So he was doing a lot of this all by himself. So we decided to address recruiting. 
And what I found when I went around uh, to meet alums, so we don't have very many uh, uh, underrepresented minority alums of the medical school. Um, I think it's about, what, 3% rich, somewhere in there? Okay. I decided I was going to visit all of them, either in person, hopefully, or by the phone. And what I found uh, was that they'd never come back to the School of Medicine. I say, why not? Well, uh, I didn't think I was treated very well when I was a student at MU. And um, I don't want to be the only one that comes back. I also found out that they were discouraging students from applying here because of the experience they had. So, how successful are we going to be recruiting students when our alums are telling the students don't apply here? Okay, it's wasted time, effort, resources. <clears throat> so a lot of what I've been doing is reaching out to alumni. And I talked to them about, I asked them, okay, so what was your experience? Give me some uh, examples, okay? And some of them aren't very pretty. They're hard to listen to. But I had no part of that, so I'm happy to have as open and difficult a discussion as anybody wants to have. I visited a guy in uh, Georgia, a cardiologist here, who was an MD PhD student here and did his internal, resident, internal medicine residency and uh, cardiology fellowship at UC San Diego, a good place. Practices in uh, Georgia. I met him last spring. Uh, Tracy and I were down on a recruiting thing at Spelman and Morehouse. And I said, I'm not here to ask you for money. He said, good, because you're not getting any. <laughs> He said, my kid went to Yale, Yale's getting all my money, all right? Here was a guy that when he was an undergrad student here and a medical student, the guy was brilliant, okay? Very smart guy. Nobody could figure out how a man of color could be so smart. So they would stand over him when he was taking his tests to make sure he wasn't cheating because they figured he had to be cheating. Now, if that wouldn't make anybody in here very angry about being here, I mean, I don't know what would. But he told me this, and we've actually become friends, as friendly as I can get with this guy, but he's warmed up to me a little bit. And actually, we text each other quite a lot. Um, and anyways, he said, but I'll tell you what. If I see that you make changes at the medical school that are sustainable, he said, I'm willing to start donating money to the University of Missouri School of Medicine. And he said, and I have the means to donate a lot of money, okay? The other part of this is getting people to come back to campus. And so we've been successful over the last couple of years for Alumni Weekend. We've actually had quite a few people come back uh, to camp campus uh, to visit because I said, okay, um, you don't have to be the only one. Let's have a whole bunch of people come back. And, and you know, and in fact, they, they, they have uh, done that. What I ask them is, look, I'm not asking for money because you're not ready to uh, donate money at this point in time. And I said, if I were you, if I, if I was you, I, I probably wouldn't be ready either. But here's what I need you to help me with. I need you to help me figure out how to make this medical school more welcoming to improve the climate and to improve the educational experience for all of our students. And also, I would like you to come back to campus occasionally and mentor some of our students. And if you would, I'd like to be able to send you some of our medical students to spend some time with you in your office. I have not had anybody say no to any of those things. So we're starting to make some progress. This pipeline stuff becomes pretty complicated, all right? Um, and you have to get down in the grade school level. Um, it's not too late at high school, but boy, it's pushing it a little bit. Um, you have to really get at kids at a younger age. But we have this affiliation with Crystal Ray High School. It's in Kansas City. Uh, they graduated their uh, second graduating class this year. They started six years ago, I guess, and they added a class a year, freshman and freshman sophomore. So we had five kids come here 
And by the way, 100% of their graduates got accepted at a university or a college. 100% of their graduates. I don't think Elias, Hickman, or Rockbridge can make that claim. But 100% of their... And here's how you get into Crystal Ray High School. You have to be dirt poor. You have to come from a big family. And you have to be a minority. And I think Krista Ray is at 60% Hispanic in, I think, okay, in about uh, what, uh, uh, or maybe not. Uh, but it's about 20% other, and it's uh, between African American and Hispanic, mostly. So, okay, and it's a Catholic private high school. There's 24 in the United States. First one was in Chicago. So how do these kids afford to go to a private Catholic high school when the requirement is you have to be dirt poor, come from a big family with a lot of kids? What they do is they have four extended school days a week. And then the fifth day, they all work in a business in either Chicago or Kansas City or wherever these 24 schools are. The amount of money that they get paid by these companies to work there a day a week over time pays for 75% of their costs. You go over and talk to these kids, they're wonderful to talk to. I mean, even the freshmen are, it's like talking to an adult. I mean, because they have to work and, you know, they, they and so anyway, so we figured, so we had five kids come here last year, who are now sophomores, that wanted to go into medicine. We weren't anticipating what all you had to do. This was the first graduating class. They hadn't been through the admissions to university. They weren't really that familiar with putting down money for a room. Most of them missed the deadline, so they show up here. They don't have a car because they don't have any money, and they find housing someplace that's not on a bus line. So what we found is that we have to start paying attention to this level of detail at the high school level for kids who are going to go to college and come here. So we learned a few lessons. Another lesson that we learned, uh, Tracy knew this, but Ellis and I weren't uh, teed up on this one. The amount of guilt some of these kids had being the oldest kid in their family to go to college, first kid, and they're not home helping support their single parent with a bunch of brothers and sisters. So a lot of them are very tempted to just to drop out and, and go back home and not go to college at all. So this whole recruiting thing gets complicated. There are all kinds of things that you know we really hadn't uh, thought about. Um, let's see if there's anything else on my list of along those lines. Um, oh yeah, <coughs> scholarships. We need to have a lot more scholarship money based on need, whether you're white, black, pink, whatever. Um, if we want diversity in our classes, that is it's also social economic uh, diversity, we have to have scholarship money. A lot of these kids don't have money. Now let me tell you a heartbreaking story. We had a recent graduate, I'm going to tell you it was last year or the year before, that walked into my office after graduation, who comes from a family, but the total income of that family is less than $15,000 a year. This person worked their way through school, worked several jobs, graduated from our medical school, was called face-to-face -face by a classmate, poor, white, trash. And people like that should not go into medicine. Can you imagine how heartbroken this person was to hear that? That's a tragedy. My concern is that how is that graduate of ours now going to view people that come in to his or her office that are poor. What kind of treatment are they going to get? You know, they need to be treated like everybody else. And so part of what we have to do, we have to be smarter here about 
you know, interviewing students. We don't want kids like that in our class. I'm sorry. I don't think uh, we need to have uh, physicians uh, that feel that way about people that uh, have lower incomes. Um, so those are some of the things that we're doing. Um, some of them are working. I say all the things that we've tried are working. We don't have a long enough track record. We just started uh, getting involved in this stuff the last couple of years. But I can tell you, if you take a look at the diversity of our current freshman class compared to our freshman class last year, we have a 113% increase in diversity uh, in our current freshman class. Our numbers aren't as good in faculty, but we have made some real progress in, in faculty recruitment. It is part of the chair's annual evaluation. They have to submit what their diversity plan is to Dr. Ingram. We talk about this to every council of chairs meeting we have. We talk about Baldridge, we talk about diversity, we talk about all of the things that we need to do uh, to be great. And by the end of the decade, I want this medical school to be in the top decile in any outcome you can measure, whether it's in education, whether it's in research, whether it's clinical care. And we're not going to do that unless we increase the diversity in the School of Medicine. And we are not, we're on a, a mission here, and we're not, we're not backing off, okay? Um, and it's going to take a decade. When we started this a couple of years ago, we all thought it was going to take a decade because we have been to many conferences and listened to deans and associate deans of a lot of medical schools in states that have a much higher population of people from diverse backgrounds than the state of Missouri does. And boy, the people that are really good at this stuff, it all took about a decade to move the needle. But I think that we are not going to be as good as we can be uh, from an educational standpoint, from a health care delivery standpoint, unless we're, we're, we're more diverse. And I really think that our key to success and excellence, part of the package besides Baldrige and hiring the right people, is having a more diverse faculty, student body, and staff. What have I left out? Oh, one more story. <clears throat> So the, this is again about understanding the differences and how you need to, we need to be more culturally competent. So I mentioned that I tried to have uh, lunch with the chaplains at our hospital at the VA maybe once a quarter. But all the hospital chaplains in Columbia get together twice a year for a lunch. One they do at Boone Hospital and one they do at uh, University Hospital. And at the last one, um, there is a, uh, a minister here in town, uh, Reverend Gary Gray. And he was talking about this issue of understanding, understanding cultural differences. And he talked about how African Americans grieve compared to Caucasians and how they grieve. Now, I think you all have seen been to a service, seen on TV, Protestant services and Catholic services and Jewish services, and you've all probably seen a service from like someplace like Second Baptist Church here in town or where the congregation is mostly African American, okay? The Caucasian services are pretty conservative, okay? <laughs> The African American church services have a lot of pizzazz, okay? They got better songs, in my view, and they seem like they're having a lot more fun than a lot of other people who are just looking at their watch, waiting, waiting to get out of there. So you might imagine that the grieving process could be different, too. And in fact, um, uh, Pastor Gray said it was, and here he said it's very emotional. There's a lot of wailing. They may climb on the bed with the deceased, okay, and they will create a ruckus. And if you don't understand that that is the way this family grieves, you're tempted to pick up the phone and call security and have them come and be escorted out of the hospital, which is the last thing you want to do 
when they lose a loved one. So that's just another example of how it pays all of us to learn more about each other from diverse <coughs> backgrounds. One last story. So when I was in medical school, from 68 to 72, there was a boy in my class, he was a man, uh, had bad cerebral palsy, very spastic cerebral palsy. It was painful to watch him walk across a room, walk up a flight of stairs, get a cigarette, back then everybody smoked, get a cigarette out of a soft pack and try to light it with a Zippo lighter. Some of you remember what Zippo lighters were, okay? <coughs> But over the course of four years in medical school, this guy had classmates where they shared a cadaver. They were in the lab doing biochemistry experiments, et cetera. And then when in clerkships, they took surgery and internal medicine and pediatrics together. And I will bet you that every single student that spent time with this medical student, his name, first name is Gary, knew a whole lot more about cerebral palsy and how it affected somebody with cerebral palsy than you could pack into any one or two hour lecture on cerebral palsy. That is why it is so important to have diversity within the faculty and the student body. We learn from each other. We are part of each other's education. It's not just the content of the lecture. It's just not the quality of the lecture. It's not just the curriculum. It are all, it's all of these other things that add to the richness of our education that you just can't simply achieve unless you have more diversity uh, within the faculty, the staff, and the student body. And that's what I want us to be because if we don't get there, we're not going to be, we're not going to realize our full potential. So with that, I think I'm going to stop and um, I'm happy to answer um, any questions you might have. I've talked 45 minutes, which was what I thought. I've got uh, Ellis and Tracy here, and I've got uh, Mike Misfeld, who's our Senior Associate Dean for Faculty Affairs, and I've got Alex Hopkins, who's our alumni uh, guy, and I've got uh, our, our Chief Medical Officer, our Senior Associate Dean for um, Medical Affairs, and I've got Rich Gleba, our uh, PR guy back there and so if you have any questions that I can't answer I've got a lot of firepower here <laughs> to uh, you know to, to answer any question I might not be up to anybody have any questions any comments yes I understand that you're uh, viewing the uh, cultural competence is coming from uh, having uh, surrounding yourself with people with different cultural backgrounds. That's a big part Faculty, of it. Faculty, yeah. staff, mm -hmm. and students. Mm -hmm. uh, are you doing anything specifically in the curriculum to inculcate cultural competence? Yes, more and more. Um, I think we haven't done... And, sorry, and, and what is that? What, cultural competence? No, no, no. What is it that you're doing? Okay, well, one of the things, um, for example, this uh, year's uh, double AFC meeting, which was a couple of weeks ago, um, I try to, I go to all of the sessions that other deans don't go to. The other medical school deans have their own dean meetings, and I don't go to hardly any of those. I need to go to meetings where I have people on the ground who are doing stuff. That's how I learn. I don't learn from other people like me as much as I learn from other people. So that's where I spend my time. So I go to a diversity of meetings and I try to get to, you know, two or three LGBT meetings because I think that this is a real issue uh, in healthcare. They have really bad health outcomes. I mean, if you can imagine growing up lesbian, gay, uh, if you think you're transgender, bisexual, whatever, uh, frequently you're uh, not accepted by the family. Uh, you may be bullied in school. You're having a hard time figuring out who you are. 
Uh, you may not come out, you may not volunteer to a health care provider. You, in fact, may not even go to a health care provider for fear of how they're going to react towards you. Okay? So, as you know, the addiction rate is high, the suicide rate is high. You know, what? And once or twice a year, what was the, the last one? A kid from Rutgers or somebody, uh, somebody uh, 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 showed something about him on the internet, and the next thing you know, he's killing himself. Okay. Uh, I feel that, you know, we don't have enough trained people uh, in LGBT, uh, not only here, but probably nationwide. I mean, there may be San Francisco or whatever, but at least around here. And see, the thing is that there's not a great acceptance of LGBT uh, in rural America. So people tend to come to towns like Columbia, St. Louis, Kansas City. And so I think that we have a population of people here whose needs are not being met by anybody. I don't know that for a fact, but our medical students, I've asked them to do a needs assessment. We have this free clinic here, this men's zoo clinic, and they have now a Latino night because they felt it was a need for a, a night for Spanish-speaking patients to come, okay? I've asked them to do a needs assessment on uh, LGBT. So when I came back from the AAMC, uh, one of the sessions I went to, it was, uh, the session was uh, put on by three students, two MD PhD students and one MD master student. And I don't remember what the mix was. There was a guy from Washington, University of Washington, and there was a woman from Stanford and a woman from Vanderbilt. And they, they, they gave the presentation. And they had, they had uh, conducted a survey of medical students throughout the country. And what they found was that Students felt pretty good about education and treatment and diagnosis of sexually transmitted diseases, HIV, AIDS. And then some of the questions that were asked were, how comfortable would you feel about taking care of patients who are gay, lesbian, transsexual, bisexual? Not very comfortable. So we're not, I'm convinced we're not getting up of that into the curriculum. Now, I said, if you don't have anybody on your faculty, you need to go out and find somebody, okay? Because this is a much bigger issue than you think. And the health outcomes of this group of people is pretty dismal, okay? They just don't go. They wait to get so sick they, they die or they, you know, it's, it's very expensive. People should not be afraid to seek health care because of who they are. And that's, that, that, that is a tragedy as far as I'm concerned. So I get back here and I start asking around. <clears throat> and we have a couple of faculty who actually uh, deal with uh, LGBT. And particularly, uh, one of the faculty uh, deals with the transgender. Okay. And so I have asked this uh, physician to write up a problem-based learning case for either the first or the second year students, where, you know, she could go back into the history, you know, you could go back to when they were high school, all of the issues that they had with family, all the psychosocial stuff, you know, and then go through, um, you know, deciding maybe to have a sex change and all of the physiologic changes that take place between male and female, all the anatomy, the surgery involved, and then all the maintenance hormone stuff that they have to have following the surgery. We need to start putting more things like that into our curriculum in the first and second year. And then we have to, if we can, if there is a need for an LGBT night in our med zoo clinic, that will be another way for our students to get exposure uh, to dealing with a diverse uh, group of patients that, you know, maybe they're not identifying themselves because, you know, the doctors are also afraid to ask some, you know, questions that, you know, I mean, doctors get embarrassed too, you know, I mean, um, it's embarrassing for doctor, some doctors to ask questions of patients as much as it is for a patient to answer some of these questions. We need to, we need to get over that. We need to break down those barriers. And I think the only way we can really do that is through education. 
So we're trying to put more into the curriculum. I would say that LGBT in the curriculum here is like it is most places. It's inadequate and we have to address that issue because I think it's, it's, it's a pretty big issue. I don't know if that answers your question. Um, but we, you know, through lectures and problem-based learning, and you know, we, we haven't done this, but we could do this with simulation too. Because um, we have scenarios all the time uh, with our students uh, where we will put them in an exam room with an actor or an actress, okay? And we videotape this stuff. And we will have them be cranky, the patient, okay? The student doesn't know what's going in, okay? They're dealing with somebody they're trying to get a history from, and the person will get off the cell phone, or, you know, they're, so we, we throw our students into situations with actors and actresses and see that, how they react to things. We could also do some of this with simulation, I think, um, uh, to, you know, to, as part of the education. Yes? You mentioned early on uh, <clears throat> some of your background, but uh, what I would be interested in is when did you develop uh, the passion that you have that goes far beyond tolerance and that kind of thing to where you are today? And how do you feel like, oh, my second part of that is, how do you feel about uh, the rest of the university <coughs> adopting the same type of attitude? on a much higher level. You know, it's funny. So I grew up in a neighborhood where there was a lot of immigrants, okay? Now, this is a long time ago. This is like in the late, you know, late 40s or 50s when I was a kid. And so we had people from different countries. Uh, we had white. We had African American. I mean, we were, we lived in tenements, okay? I mean, and so there wasn't really a lot of choice. This was after the war. You know, housing wasn't the greatest then. I mean, a lot of people just took what was available. And so, uh, and I grew up in a, in a town where the grade school, you could walk to the grade schools, okay? I don't think anybody was more than about six blocks from any grade school. It wasn't until I went to high school <laughs> that I, I found out how poor we were. <laughs> you know, when you're living with people who look like you, you know, nothing stands out. It wasn't until I went to high school that I thought, Wow, you know, and so I kind of felt like uh, an outsider, you know. I mean, it was like I didn't fit. I didn't have the clothes. I didn't have the car. I didn't have, you know, it was like, and so in a way, I, I don't think anybody discriminated against me. It was what I felt. And so I've always tried to put myself in somebody else's position or shoes. You know, how are they viewing what's going on around them. How can I be sensitive to what they're going through? And I, I guess I use, now not to the extreme, I mean, I, I don't think that what I went through as a kid was as bad as a lot of people in this room, but it was, it was to a degree, um, embarrassing. Uh, and so I think it, it got, I had an appreciation from a very young age uh, and I've always uh, had this. And, and the other thing, too, I was blessed to have parents who were absolutely non discriminatory. Okay? Uh, I mean, it was, uh, it was no big deal to have a black family living in the tenement right across us where our porch is connected. Okay? I mean, that's the way. And so there was never any, there was never any fear. Uh, there was uh, my parents, my father never said, you know, gee, look out. I mean, it was, uh, I just didn't grow up that way. Uh, and so it really troubles me when I see discrimination. Uh, it bothers me a lot. And so um, that's kind of, you know, where I'm coming from. It's, it, it's not like I just had this epiphany, you know, 12 years ago. Or, you know, I mean, this is the way I've been all my life. Um, and in a way, I think I'm lucky because to have had that experience, I don't know, you know, how I look at things if I grew up with a silver spoon in my mouth. You know, I don't know. So I actually feel lucky um, of the background that I came from. Uh, and I would hope that, um, uh, you know, people on campus would uh, start looking at this as an excellence in education and a delivery of whatever, you know, with us it's healthcare delivery, 
I don't know it would be education. I mean, I can see where there's maybe a direct translation education. I don't know about all the other schools, but I think there is something in this for everybody uh, with diversity because it just makes us a richer place. And I think our students are better off for it. I mean, I always learn a lot more from people that are different from me in a shorter amount of time than I learn from somebody that's just like me. There's not a lot going on there. I mean, I know them, you know. But I don't know you, and I don't know, uh, you know, but it, it's, it just it makes life a lot more interesting to uh, kind of immerse yourself in, in you know, diversity. You know, there's an old saying, right? That variety is the spice of life, you know. I mean, I, I believe that. Yes? Um, I was wondering, what is your recruitment process like to find students from such a wide range of diverse backgrounds? Yeah, um, it's uh, active. Um, because of the reputation we've had over the years as not being the most welcoming place, we have to overcome that. So we really have to go out of our way when students come to campus uh, to visit, that we present ourselves in a nice, uh, welcoming, inclusive environment, okay? Uh, and but, but it is something we've had to overcome, especially when we've got alums in the state that are telling students, don't apply, you know. Go to SLU, you know, what? Nothing wrong with SLU, but, you know, um, we're the state school, come here. Um, and so it's, it's uh, and I've got Tracy who is a master at uh, uh, recruiting um, and she really has a way with students and talking to students and when they come here she brings them into her family and you know she treats them like one of her kids um, and so uh, that really goes a long way. We also have some programs now uh, that's for disadvantaged students to come and spend a couple of days to learn more about what it takes to get into medical school. The other thing I forgot to mention is that uh, Noor and her friend Martin, M-A-A-R-T-E-N, who's of Dutch heritage, uh, put on this, um, I'll find it here someplace, uh, the uh, Development of Cultural Competency in Leaders. It was a two-day course, and it was all of the leaders from the uh, three schools, the School of Health Professions, Nursing and Medicine, and the hospital system. Uh, we also sent a couple of groups of uh, uh, faculty uh, and staff last year to the um, Inclusion Institute for Healthcare in St. Louis. We plan on sending a couple of more cohorts there this year. Um, it's a three-day immersion in um, diversity and where you learn about your biases and bigotry and all that stuff so you better, I mean, because people have unconscious biases. They have biases that you may not know that they have, okay? Um, and so we've also hosted uh, last year the uh, NAMI meeting, which is the National Association of Minority Medical Educators. We hosted the regional meeting here. Uh, two years ago, we hosted the uh, Student National Medical Association meeting here, big regional meeting from uh, 10 states, and we had, what, 300 kids here? And, you know, one of the things that I really feel good about, I mentioned to Gary Forsey and Brady Deaton uh, uh, two or three months before we were hosting this uh, SNMA meeting, and I almost didn't have the words out of my mouth when they said we'll be there. So, I mean, Gary showed up and Brady showed up and Hal showed up and these are, you know, a diverse group of students from 10 states. And, you know, Gary's working the audience for C, you know, shaking hands and stuff. And I mean, to make them feel welcome here. So that's part of the process too, is, you know, to presenting ourselves as this is a good place for you to come. It's an inclusive place, it's a safe place, and you're gonna get as good a medical education here as any place in the country. And I'll put our board scores up against Harvard and Hopkins and everybody else. Our mean score this year on step two was close to the, what, the 90th, 98th percentile? That's our average score. 
that's pretty good. Okay? We're, we're like two standard deviations above the national average. But as good as that is, we can be better. And that's what we want to do. You had your hand up in the back. Yeah, I was just wondering, with all the premium being put on diversity and having a lot of different students from different backgrounds, does it make it harder for students that are also very competent applicants to get into the colleges and not as diverse as the other ones? Could you relay that to me? I'm 15 years a member of the AARP and I've got my Medicare card. My wife is always telling me, turn down the TV. So my hearing isn't as good as it used to be. Um, Steve, did you hear what he said? Somebody just want a little closer? I think the question was, uh, if you are going to advance diversity in your selection process, does that put other people at a disadvantage? Well, it depends on what you're trying to achieve, okay? You know, if you need to have a educational experience that is better than the one that you have had, and that in, in includes increasing diversity, I suppose in a way you're right. But on the other hand, it's going to be a better experience for people to get in. I mean, that's always going to be a, a dilemma. Um, but people bring different things to medical school. Let me, let me give you, for instance, there's this new type of interview going around now, um, and I think it's something we need to look at. It's called MMI. It started at McMaster University in Canada. Because let me tell you, the traditional medical school interview now is that, you know, you, we have all of your stuff, we look at your board score, your, your MCAT scores, and your grade point average, and you know, we decide. So last year we had 1,771 applicants. We interviewed 450 students, okay? That's a lot. And the MCAT scores were, you know, there were some low, there were some high. To believe it or not, really high MCAT scores put you at risk for graduating too. It's not just the low ones, it's the really high ones. Um, and so anyways, so people feel that there's some bias in that because, so you come and you interview with two faculty members for an hour and then they meet with all of the admissions committee and everybody tries to sell their two students to the rest of the committee that, you know, and you, they come up with a, a list of people they're going to accept, okay. This new method, and there are, I don't know, maybe a dozen schools now doing this, it's totally different. You use a holistic review process to decide who you are going to interview. All right? And then instead of the students spending an hour with two people, what they do is they have the student interview with six people for six minutes each. And they don't get to see the grade point average or the MCAT score. So you're taking that bias out of the interviewer. They have a scenario that takes two minutes to read. And then you walk in the room and you sit down with the interview person and you get to describe how you would react to that scenario. Six minutes are up, you go outside, you read the next two minute ones and you go in for another six minute interview. So these people don't form a, a relationship with the interviewer or the student and they aren't looking at the great points. They're starting to look now at the essence of what is this person all about. We're trying, they're trying to look at the things that we feel are important and that you'd want in your personal position. That's really divorced from grades and, and MCAT scores. I really think we get too hung up on uh, MCAT scores and um, grade point average. Now I'll just give you and so uh, people that are doing this think it's a lot more objective, it's a, better, it's, a, it's a better shape for the students, okay? And so I think we need to take a look at that. Now let's just tell you my scenario. So I took the MCAT examination without having organic chemistry and physics. What do you think my scores must have looked like? Okay, well back in that day we didn't uh, get our scores. You pay a fee, you take the test, you give them six places to send your test results, and that was it. And I remember um, going, I was in an interview at Loyola University where I 
eventually wound up going, and I was talking to one of the associate deans, and he said, man, your MCAT scores are awful. <laughs> Just awful. I said, well, you know, I didn't have organic chemistry or physics. But I got in on a basis of the interview, and my GPA, they discounted the MCAT score. I probably wouldn't get in here today. Now, you could argue whether or not I've had a moderately successful career. Okay? <laughs> you could argue either way. But the fact is, I got where I'm at with a lousy MCAT score. So another story. So I only took one IQ test in my life. I had to take an IQ test to go to college, okay? They made everybody take an IQ test. This was 1964. I scored 100. That was average. So I was kind of proud of that. You know, look, you can be just average, have an IQ of 100, and become a dean, okay? <laughs> So somebody came in my office within six months and said, you know, a hundred's no longer average. Well, I watched jaywalking. I figured the average now has to be like 85 or 90, you know? I mean, and I said, what is it? They said, it's 110. I said, it makes the story even better. The point is, a lot of this, we put too much importance on a lot of this stuff. You need a basement level of accomplishment. So it's not a risk for you to come to medical school, okay? But it's not sky high, okay? But we get all these wonderful scores, and, and we're not paying attention to the essence of what somebody is. We need to stop paying as much attention to that stuff as we do. We need to start, you know, looking into the soul of our students and say, do they have the things that I want to have in my personal position? We ought to spend more time selecting our students on that than these other markers. Um, there is some correlation, but, you know, I can tell you at, um, I think our average MCAT score here is, uh, what, 31? about 31.5. <clears throat> and one of these MMI schools, which is uh, that I heard the presentation, it was the um, uh, Robert Wood Johnson School of Medicine in New Jersey. Their floor for MCAT is 22. Most places looking at 27, 26, and their basement for GPA is 3. And they're perfectly satisfied with the students that they are admitting and that they graduate and they pass their board examinations because there's more to getting through than that score that you got on a particular day. Anything else? Well, I appreciate your attention. I don't know if this is in the application of what you guys are doing, but this is what we're doing. If you have any ideas that uh, you think would work for us, uh, please contact uh, me or Dr. Ingram or Tracy or somebody in the School of Medicine. Thanks for your attention.